Welcome everyone one more once again. Um, I would love to start to, to get started by telling you a little bit about the agenda for today. Nicole, can you help me out? Um, so we're going to start with uh, some very quick introductions and we're going to have a fantastic conversation with uh, Ari and Christian who are our um, uh, guests today. Uh, then we're going to have a little bit of a Q&A with the audience and uh, then we're going to have a, a breakout sessions. Um, uh, the difference between the Q&A with the audience and the breakout sessions is that from uh, past experience we understand that these conversations can can, can happen in kind of like two levels. You know, we want to have a, a public facing conversation about what it means for policy, for uh, for industry, for the way we invest. And there's also, there's like this other level of conversation which is more private and it requires some more inner, in, inward uh, looking and, um, and, and maybe a more private conversation. So that's why we're having these two moments, like you with, with an audience and then also a breakout session. And then we're gonna have some closing remarks and we're hopefully going to end up connected uh, and we will have uh, learned a uh, lot from each other and uh, started uh, hopefully prompting new, um, uh, new actions, new activities and new collaborations. Um, so without further ado, we're gonna start with introductions. So let me introduce myself. Uh, today, I am, um, uh, I am your host. I have the privilege of being your host for this conversation. I am the Executive Director of Strategy and Content at Soka Global. I joined this year. I'm very excited. I, be, I had been a Soka participant for a long time um, and then uh, been able to be a part of the team and uh, and thinking through through content, both content and strategy is something that was super exciting and is a dream come true. I absolutely love working with this team. Um, uh, before that, uh, I, uh, well, I, I led Impacto, which was an ecosystem building B Corp, uh, working from Ecuador for the Andean region. And I also um, am a fund manager for a small impact investment fund in the Andean region. Um, so uh, with, with that perspective in mind, I am also uh, uh, very excited to introduce to you uh, Aria Florence. She is the co-founder and managing director of Liberation Ventures. Aria is constantly uh, navigating different worlds um, black and white, grassroots and corporate, ethnic studies and finance, um, and she's always building bridges uh, in between. She's the co-founder and managing director of Liberation Ventures, which is a field catalyst and a philanthropic organization fueling the US Black-led movement for racial repair. Pri prior to Liberation Ventures, Aria served public and, uh, and social sector clients at McKinsey and Company and helped uh, uh, found the McKinsey Institute for Black Economic Mobility. She was also an organizer in East Palo Alto, California, focusing on youth development and civic engagement. Um, in 2017, she helped launch the first ever round of programs at the Obama Foundation. So we're just extremely, extremely excited to hear from Aria and her incredible and very uh, uh, broad experience as well. Um, uh, also with us today, we have Christian Vorking. Uh, Vorking. Um, he is the Vice President and Director at True Venture, at True Ventures. Uh, he leads TrueVentures.org, an initiative designed to find, fund, and support entrepreneurs uh, devoting their careers to generating social returns. Previously, he worked in the Venture Research Group at Cambridge Associates and in network development at Bright, uh, Bright Roll, an early true portfolio company. Um, so with that, I would love to, uh, to get us started and, and maybe have the conversation going. I want to just do a quick sound check. If everyone ha that, uh, that, uh, that has their, their camera on can uh, give their thumbs up and understand that we are uh, going to be also recording the session and turning it into a, a podcast. Um, so maybe to, to, to get us started, Aria, hi, how are you? Hi, I'm well. Thanks for having me. And thank you, everyone who joined. Yeah, thank you so much. We're, we're, we're very excited. I mean, after, after having a, a workshop with you last year at SOCAP, and uh, unfortunately, I didn't attend the workshop, but I heard amazing things about the workshop, uh, mostly because it also, uh, as you said, navigated different worlds, right? So uh, sometimes you show up at a conference and you think, okay, SOCAP, you better turn out the suit and the business cards, and you think that all conversations are going to be somewhat uh, formal. And then you come up with this incredible workshop that not only... Uh, uh, helped us understand uh, a broader movement, but also just look inward. So before we get into this, um, 
And we would love to hear a little bit more about you, uh, where you come from. Tell us about your, your career journey and also what led you to leave McKinsey and then co-found Liberation Ventures. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so I am, I'm originally from Colorado. Uh, that's where I grew up and it definitely plays a role in my story and the journey that I've taken to get to here. Um, my family is interracial. My mom is white. My dad is black. And we lived in a pretty small, well, small-ish town called Fort Collins, about an hour north of Denver, um, that was mostly white, only about 2.5% black. And so my experience growing up there definitely shaped kind of what I did after I left, um, because the messages that I always got from my parents were very much sort of like, you got to be twice as good. You can't give anyone a reason to doubt you because you're the only black girl in most of your classes and extracurriculars and sports teams. Um, and so I grew up kind of thinking, um, like understanding that, but not really having a lot of the context for why that was the case, um, until I went to college and studied ethnic studies, as I said in my bio, um, which was really sort of like a, a healing journey for me to actually dig deep into the history of this country um, and how structural racism has evolved over time. Um, and so much of that was really helpful in giving me the language to talk about my experience in Colorado. So that's a big part of like sort of personally what brings me to the work. Um, and, um, you know, I started out my career journey in East Palo Alto, California. It's just about 20 minutes down the road from Stanford where I went to undergrad. Um, if a lot of folks, if y'all you, if you are in the Bay, then you know East Palo Alto is um, a small majority minority city. Um, it's about 2.5 square miles that has a extremely rich history of self-determination and Afrocentrism, but was also the place where Black folks in the Bay were sort of redlined into um, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and it's still a place that has um, a number of just incredible uh, community organizations um, really organizing for development in East Palo Alto. So I moved there, started working there, focused most of my work on things related to youth development and civic engagement. And I really still consider East Palo Alto home in a lot of ways. I just learned so much about um, what it means to show up in communities and to be really like actionably working for racial justice. Um, however, at the same time, um, I worked for some tiny nonprofits and I wanted to get a better sense for what it would mean and like what skills I needed to develop in order to run a nonprofit. And so I went to the East Coast for graduate school, um, thought I would get all those skills in graduate school, but I didn't, which is how I ended up at McKinsey, um, because not only did I want to get some of the skills that you can get in managing consulting, but um, I also then had loans that I needed to pay off. <laughs> um, so I got pretty lucky. Uh, I worked in the DC office and um, served uh, mostly public and social sector clients and um, did a, lo a lot of work internally prior to 2020 uh, because once I started at McKinsey, I basically saw that there was a real opportunity for the firm to support, to do research on the racial wealth gap um, and to ensure that all of the recommendations that it was providing to its clients were not making racial equity worse, um, which meant that the firm would need to build capabilities in order to understand that. And so I started driving a lot of that work internally. And since 2020, that has developed into um, the Black, the Institute for Black Economic Mobility at McKinsey. Um, but to get to your question, why did I leave? Um, I started thinking with a co-founder about four and a half years ago, really trying to answer this question of um, how do we develop a deep, deep, deep root cause level intervention on racial injustice? Because a lot of the work that he and I were seeing across the sector was great work, but often really treating symptoms that were further downstream. And so we started asking ourselves, like, what does it really look like to get upstream? Um, and through a ton of thinking and learning and talking to people, uh, we really landed on kind of two really strong 
um, forces that we believe are deep root causes for why our systems are still so unjust. And those are the racial wealth gap and anti-Black narratives. And when we thought about what could um, be the solution, we came to reparations um, in particular because we, you know, looking back at history, you know, Reconstruction was only 12 years after slavery, the period of slavery was 250. Um, and so we really started to see this work as sort of an unfinished, uh, the unfinished work of Reconstruction. And the way we think about it is that if reparations could really shock the system on those two anchors, then you would actually see positive ripple effects across different systems, including education and health, et cetera. Um, across the country. So that's how that's how it started. And, um, you know, the rest is history. Wow, that's, uh, that's amazing. And I think that I mean, I, as, as you were describing this, you know, your, your more personal story, I'm just thinking, wow, how lucky, uh, you know, how lucky is, is, is this broader community that, uh, that the, these little uh, accidents of history to continue to happen to bring together these very different pointed points of view inside one mind as well. Um, I, I know that um, that a lot of the, the biggest trailblazers that, that, that I know that I personally had a chance to, to have conversations with tend to come from the fringes of each of these different worlds and end up kind of like, you know, drawing this bridge across. Uh, so thanks so much for sharing that. Um, so now you 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 mentioned preparation. So you know, after thinking about you know uh, about the size of the challenge, about you know about after having seen the numbers, you know, setting up this institute, looking at uh, you know at, at different policies to prevent that that further uh, inequality it takes place. You know, you land on reparations. So tell us a little bit more about how do you define reparations? I think that, that that's something that. That we all come at with with honest curiosity, and and what are the most common misconceptions about reparations? Because I know that that sometimes words come a little bit, uh, you know, charged, and that could be either a great opportunity to start a conversation or to end. So so help us uh, uh, navigate, uh, you know, our own our own reactions to the word reparations. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, and I recognize that the word can be charged um, and I'll talk about sort of how I think about that. Um, so I think that the, the, the UN, um, you know, has sort of a definition of reparations as it's applied to legal frameworks. And that's the UN basic principles and right to a remedy and reparation. Um, and that I think is the most sort of like universally understood definition of all of the different um, sort of components uh, and pieces of uh, uh, what reparations can look like in particular in um, the context of a sort of transitional justice scenario. It's been really used around the globe. Um, and, but when we started our work a few years ago, we started with sort of a slightly different question, which is basically like, what is repair? Um, what are the core components of repair? Um, I guess something that I learned in consulting was, you know, you can have these sort of abstract concepts, but they're really hard to implement if you can't kind of break them down into smaller pieces. And so we did a ton of learning um, about reparative processes all around the globe um, and came to the framework that we use. And I will say that our framework is really built upon uh, those UN principles and sort of the broader transitional justice toolkit, as well as a real legacy of restorative justice um, that we believe is also relevant in this case. Um, and our framework basically includes four components. It's reckoning, acknowledgement, accountability and redress. So I'll say that again, and, it's reckoning. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, and I'm, I'm go, um, for, for those of, of you who are just listening, uh, you're gonna have to, uh, to go to our website and, and look at the actual framework, but we're going to share it here at the webinar. Awesome. Uh, we have a, a, a little slide that, that might aid in helping us through, through the four components. Um, thanks. Awesome, yes. So reckoning, really deeply learning and understanding harm that has been caused. Um, acknowledgement is actually taking what we've learned and then naming or voicing that understanding. And in particular, acknowledgement um, is often important to make harmed parties feel really seen and give harmed parties the, the opportunity to clarify or to deepen our understanding. 
Um, acknowledgement also is really what sort of sets a new standard around cultural norms, around what's possible, because the, something has been voiced uh, about what's not, it, what's um, not okay. Um, accountability is really shifting us into the present uh, and really taking ownership over what is going to, what we're gonna stop doing in order to stop causing harm. Um, and then redress is really about um, taking action that both sort of restore the harmed party to um, ideally a position that they were in before the harm. In some cases, that's not possible. And so it's really taking action that relates to um, or that really um, catalyzes community level healing. Um, but then also action that uh, really creates an equitable world in the future. Um, and you know what I will say is I think one of the so I'll name a couple of the misconceptions about reparations um, that you just um, that that or that you asked me to. Um, one is that uh, a lot of people think that reparations is really just cash or just about money in general. Um, and as you can see from these four components, three of them are actually not about money. Um, and that is a big big message that the reparations movement. Um, and, and a lot of the movement partners that we work with really want to get across is that it is about the money, but it's also about so much more than the money. Um, because in essence, this isn't just an economic project, but really a political and a cultural project. Um, and then the second thing I'll say is that it's not just about the past. It's also about the future. So I think that is really important to hold because a lot of folks will say like, if I'm not black, what does this have to do with me? Um, and what it has to do is the fact that we are all responsible for building a just and equitable future. Um, and the reality is that our current society is built on a lot of the legacy of injustice that stems from the origins of this country. And therefore we are all responsible for repairing it. So mm, that's how thank we you so much. Yeah. I'll say, and, can um, I just say one other thing? Sorry, Michelle. Um, I will also name that, you know, we think about applying this framework to not only the public sector, but also the private sector and the social sector, you know, our churches, our schools, like we, at our highest level essence at Liberation Ventures, like we are working toward building a culture of repair. And we believe that that culture of repair can be, you know, being cultivated in institutions across the country that are not just in the the public sector. And so that was also why we really thought it was important to um, build upon those other legal frameworks and create one that also really applies to culture. Um, because we know that actually our policy is actually only as durable as our culture change. Like we could try to, we could close the racial wealth gap tomorrow, but it would just reopen if we weren't really changing the systems and the culture um, along the way that are going to be needed in order to keep it close. Thank you so much. And and this, uh, um, I, I, a couple of thoughts came to my mind, you know, I was thinking as, as we were putting together this webinar, there was actually a lot of interest from, from very global audiences as well, just that, you know, like thinking with, with this curiosity about like, how do you think through all the other, all the other historical processes that have taken place, you know, that also require this, this rep, like culture of repair yes. as well. Uh, and, and also uh, I recognize a lot, I, I mean, I didn't mention it, but I did have a prior career as a human rights lawyer. And I was thinking through, through how, yeah. you know, frameworks like these could actually make it a lot easier for uh, like, I don't know, victims groups in, in like a post-conflict Colombia right now, for example, I had a great meeting last week with, with a group and, uh, uh, and, you know, and in Cambodia as well, just they were all thinking through how how repair relates to them and how it's far more than what you said, cash or a check. It, it has so much more to do with, with society as a whole. Um, so thank you. Um, now, okay, I'm going to see if we, we can, you know, we're, this is this is very inspiring uh, concept, fantastic frameworks. Framework, how does this land into Liberation Ventures? And, 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 and what does Liberation Ventures do with this framework um, as well? Great question. Yeah. So this framework really anchors us in terms of sort of what we're building towards, what our vision really looks like in a more concrete sense. Um, 
But we also use this framework internally. You know, we believe that it's really important to build a culture of repair inside of liberation ventures. Um, and so we've actually applied this to when we've had breakdown like among our team, uh, because the thing that we believe is that actually, you know, the difference are we are ultimately trying to build a multiracial democracy and a multiracial democracy is going to have to hold so many different communities across lines of difference and difference often causes um, breakdown or conflict um, or harm. And in our view, that difference and really the alchemy of what it means to fully belong across with if, with all of your multitudes, with all of your difference, um, that we only get there if we have a culture of repair because we are only as strong as our ability to repair that difference. And so I would say that's how it, we kind of think about it in essence. Um, but I'll also name a little bit of just the tactics around what we do. Um, we are a field catalyst in the reparations movement, which means that we sort of sit in between groups on the ground as well as larger sort of philanthropies. We sit in between them and we operate, we solely exist to support groups on the ground and help them become kind of more than the sum of their parts and really build momentum toward our North Star, which is federal comprehensive policy. Um, so our three streams of work are grant making, capacity building, and narrative change work. Um, and I would say that this framework really sits within um, and with within those pillars across in different ways. But I think it, within the narrative pillar, um, one of the things that uh, our movement partners have shared is that it really is important to be talking about, be sort of reimagining, reframing reparations to be more than just the money um, and to be um, really about like building a multiracial democracy. And I think this this framework really helps us do that. Mm, that's fantastic. And, and I guess, well, I'm going to stop there for a second and we can stop sharing screen for a second because I would love to then um, kind of honor to to that there's a couple of people in, in this uh, webinar that are probably also having flashbacks to this amazing workshop that, that was held at SOCAP 22. And uh, uh, at least one of those people uh, is, is also here. Um, so I wanted to, to ask uh, Christian a little bit about, uh, about when did you first hear about this framework that Aria is uh, mentioning and, and, uh, and you know, what initially struck you about, about not just Aria's work, but also about liberation ventures? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. You're quite right. I was having flashbacks as Aria talked about the work that she and her team are doing and your framing of the SOCAP session and how it all came together last fall. And I was re remembering being there at Yerba Buena, looking at the program agenda and thinking about all the exciting things were happening and how do I choose only one. I leaned into this and I sat through a session that was really powerful and at the end of it all, I was struck by the emotion that came out of the conversation. I was struck by the depth of the conversation, and it was awesome. It really got the wheels turning. Uh, when you think about this and the work that, that is happening here, it fits actually really nicely into what's always inspired us for the better part of 20 years as a firm. Uh, we are an early stage venture capital firm based out of the San Francisco Bay Area, and We've always gotten excited about what we call founders of movements and, and products that can capture the imagination. And honestly, as we think about this year, what bolder movement could there be than attempting to address the greatest foundational and systemic flaw in American history, right? The fact that we are not the great representative democracy that we claim to be or that we hope to be. So uh, there was definitely a lot in that first session that got me interested. And as I talked to more people, as I did my best to educate myself about reparations and how we might be a thoughtful partner to Ari and her team, uh, that led to more conversations. And it's been a, a wonderful relationship that began that day very much unexpected to me. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Christian. Not just because you're very, uh, you, you can hear from the tone of your voice that it actually struck a chord very personally, not just with that investor's hat on, but just with that full human hat. Um, but but also because we love hearing about these types of stories actually taking place at SOCAP. That's why SOCAP exists, so that we can connect, uh, you know, unlikely allies in this case. Um, 
So, so what made you decide to invest in in the Bration Ventures? You, you know, just from this like investors perspective, you mentioned the idea of movement building and just being real catalysts. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that process of I don't even know even, even I would call it due diligence would look like? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. It was a, a fun process, and we're thrilled with the way it ended up, uh, namely that we are in partnership with Liberation Ventures. What gets us excited initially is a, a powerful combination of a really incredible uh, novel idea and then a founder or a group of founders that often have the lived experience or some deep visceral belief that they are the right people to solve that problem or to move the needle on that problem. This wonderful sense of founder market fit, where we say not only is this a huge problem that the world needs to solve, but also this is the right person or these are the right people to in fact do that. Uh, ideas alone are certainly important, but without the right protagonist, they will never reach their full potential. And the more we leaned into what Aria and her team are doing, the more we learned, the more we got impressed that this seemingly massive, intractable, immense, unsolvable problem actually was being broken down into a whole series of very reasonable, manageable, and practical steps. It kind of felt like, wow, something that seems impossible actually <laughs> could be possible. Um, so that process, the vision really resonated with us. Finally, I would say the model resonated as well. Uh, when you look at that introductory screen there, you see uh, Aria, Liberation Ventures, Christian True Ventures. It's not a coincidence that the names of our organizations both have ventures in them. Uh, we have been for 20 years now building a portfolio of like-minded founders trying to put their heads together and create a sum of the parts that is so much more than all these different pieces coming together on their own. Uh, it's a powerful experience building within a community of supportive peers, and it made so much sense to us as we think about narrative, as we think about community, as we think about collaboration. Yes, we've seen this work on our portfolio. Uh, it also should work. It's something that could be incredibly powerful and helpful for everyone within the Liberation Ventures world as well. Uh, all the movement partners, they should be talking. They should be all working off the same playbook. They should be making sure that what works for one can work for many. Um, and by the way, what's not working for one, that maybe shouldn't be repeated otherwise. So there was a lot about the model that really resonated too. And I would say, I hope there's a lot that Liberation Ventures can learn from what we as an organization have been doing and vice versa. We are already learning a lot from the way they do their work and the way they bring together their community to create change as well. No, thank you so much, Christian, and uh, uh, and and I love what you mentioned, uh, not just about uh, you know about the model, but just about like the right protagonists as well, and uh, um, you know, and so you mentioned the model a couple of times. I would love for Aria to to maybe tell us about the model. I mean, this this uh, this webinar and this podcast will be listened to by all kinds of uh, Christian like characters. Uh, so so maybe you can share uh, with us a little bit more about what is the model? What is this unique value proposition that you're uh, putting forward with Liberation Ventures? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll also, I think, name some resources that I think are relevant um, as, I, as I talk about this too. Um, so I mentioned we're a field catalyst. And I know that's kind of like jargon, um, especially in sort of philanthropy world. Um, but I think that the, that role in movements is becoming more and more and more sort of known and visibilized. Bridgespan actually just did a long piece about the role of field catalysts, um, which I highly recommend looking up. And, and um, we were excited to be part of that, um, that research that they did. And I think that the, the thing about field catalysts that can be challenging is that when field catalysts do their work right, they are really leading from the background. Um, you are sort of really amplifying folks in the movement and supporting them um, and doing a lot of the sort of like behind the scenes thinking about what connections need to be made and whose, whose work relates to whose work and what can be learned from this place and transposed to that place. Um, and the more you do that, the more you can really um, sort of congeal so much different activity um, into something that's um, really sort of then accelerating the progress that the movement can make. And so, as I mentioned, um, we do grant making and capacity building and narrative change. 
grant making is, you know, as you would expect, um, we're an intermediary grant maker. So we raise dollars from larger foundations and regranted. And one of the, um, we're actually working on a um, co-authored piece about intermediaries right now. One of the biggest um, benefits to having intermediaries in a space is that you can get to know a, a space that's pretty niche very, very well um, and do a lot of the deep sourcing and diligence work that a larger foundation just wouldn't <laughs> have the capacity to do. Um, so um, that is really kind of our value add to the grant making space. And, um, you know, we have 31 amazing movement partners that we granted to uh, in our round in our second round of granting this year, which was $2.2 million round. Um, the capacity building piece is basically the non-financial support piece for the movement partners that we are investing in. And so a lot of those organizations are small, are new, even if they're not new, they may not have been being funded at the levels that they deserve. And so um, maybe still sort of building out some of their um, infrastructure, especially on the operational side. So we do a lot of just like, um, kind of one-to-one -one tailored projects with our movement partners related to fundraising, related to communications, related to strategic planning, related to hiring and talent. Um, it's really whatever our movement partners need and want. Um, and, you know, I will say we love that work because it's what keeps us kind of close to the ground. It Like we learn so much about what the movement needs by doing that work with our partners. Um, and I will say that is um, a tough thing we're figuring out is how to scale that because the current model that we use, that we use is not as scalable as a structured program would be. And so that's one of the questions we're answering as an organization right now. Um, but I'll also say that within that capacity building bucket, we also think about that as like what can build the capacity of the entire field. So in particular, a lot of our research work falls under that category. Um, we do public opinion polling and we are um, uh, we, we have something cooking on the research side uh, in partnership with um, a big think tank that you all know that I won't announce yet, um, but is coming. Uh, so, and that will be an opportunity, or that will be a, a, a program that's really designed to support academics and researchers in the academy and think tanks connect with movement partners on the ground and really share what they're learning from their research, as well as hear from movement partners about the questions they need answered uh, so that they can, you know, so, so that those two communities can really better work together. So back to the bridge building um, that you mentioned, Michelle. Um, and then the last thing I'll name is the narrative change work. And so we just know that there are so many um, myths and misconceptions out there about reparations, what reparations are, what they mean, who they're for. And so a big part of our work is to help make it easier for um, folks to go to one place and really understand the mental models and the frames and the stories and the messages that we really want to to kind of tell the full story of this movement. Um, and in particular for social justice and racial justice organizations that don't already work on reparations, we wanna start to make it easier for them to understand how to be talking about it and thinking about it and applying it to their own work. Um, so there will also be a number of resources coming out on the narrative side uh, in the late summer time period. Um, so that's amazing. So yeah, and, and I would just say as a last thing, we really see our work as evolving as the movement evolves. So if we do our work right, the needs of the movement will change as the movement grows. Um, it may be that we can really work ourselves out of a job on the grant making side because we've convinced all of the big progressive foundations to stand up reparations program areas and to give to the movement directly. Um, a big part of our role is donor organizing. Uh, that's not the case right now, but we we think about our role as um, really sort of um, uh, evolving as the movement does and as it grows. And so we'll see how that changes over time. Mm. So uh, th thank you so much, because I'm just thinking as, as you're describing all of these elements of, of, of what the Ventures does, 
it really is systems change. And it's just kind of like playing acupuncture, right? Like what, what are the right pinches that you need yeah. to do to, <laughs> to change an entire system? So, so thanks so much for your work. Um, uh, just for, for folks that are here that are trying to get their heads around, like, you know, like how does this become tangible? Because that's one of the challenges of system change. You know, it, yeah. it's, uh, it's the narrative behind it. Could you give us an example of a movement partner that that you've worked with uh, that uh, that is particularly inspiring or could or that, that could um, articulate a little bit more tangibly, like what is it that you're that you're trying to see when you uh, when you offer a grant? Yeah, absolutely. Oh gosh, there's so many groups that I could highlight, but I will I will talk about Robin Rue Simmons who was an alder woman in Evanston and was the person in Evanston that really was behind, was the driving force behind passing reparations policy in Evanston. Um, so I'll name that just as an example, because I think it is really important to, um, to highlight that reparations is happening. Um, it has been happening across the globe in so many different countries, you know, reparations were paid to the descendants of Holocaust victims, Holocaust victims and their descendants. Um, they were paid by the U.S., the Japanese Americans. Um, we've done reparations in Evanston, in Chicago for police torture, in Rosewood, Florida. So there are so many different cases, um, and there really is a deep precedent for reparation um, across the globe and across time. Um, but Evanston is one of the most recent in the U.S., um, Robin Rue Simmons really drove that work through as an older woman, but then she left and started a nonprofit called First Repair, which is a nonprofit geared towards helping other municipalities across the country do what she did. And so she has been, um, so we invested in First Repair um, and support First Repair on a number of different projects. Robin, like Robin is awesome. And um, like, she, she, if only we could sort of multiply her um, so she, she could be everywhere because there are so many task forces that are actually being stood up across the country, both at the city level and at the state level. And so there's a lot of really exciting work in the sort of place-based reparations um, domain right now. And I would say that's something to keep a lookout for both like in your area, but also uh, I would say a lot of the national coverage right now um, is about where where it's happening, you know, in California and other places. Wow, well, thank you so much. And that's a, that's a fantastic example because it's not just about, you know, this one case, but it's just about this case, yeah, like you said, multiplying its, its, its impact. Um, Thank you so much, Aria and, and, and Christian. And uh, I feel like I've, I've had the, all the privilege to have uh, all the questions uh, to myself. So I'm going to uh, ask people in, in the room to see if they have any questions to please uh, raise your hand uh, and mute yourselves. I think you, you're all able to mute yourselves. You have the, the, the Zoom set up. So um, we can start a conversation going. And if you wanted to write your questions on the chat as well, uh, that's that's all right. And uh, well, okay. Well, we uh, wait for questions to come up. I don't see any just yet. Now you're also thinking about it. Aria, uh, what, where do you see Liberation Ventures in 10 years, in 20 years? Great question. You know, I'll go far out and then I'll walk myself backwards. Um, when I imagine you know, the other side of reparations, like what does this country look like with a culture of repair? Um, I think that there are a number of things that I would say, um, there are the obvious ones around, you know, our, um, our systems, our economic system, our political systems are, um, are not harming black people anymore. Um, we live in a place where, um, there is real sort of justice and care and equity built into those systems. Um, but then I would also say that there are different cultural norms related to how we think about repair. It, almost as if like we, we live in a more repair literate society where everyone learns the fundamentals of repair, whether it's uh, interpersonally or how to be an agent of repair in your institution or organization, just like you learn math or just like you learn science. Like it's just something that we decide as a, as a, as a nation that is an incredibly important muscle to build. 
Um, and I think that if we were to do that, we, you know, the third thing I'll say is that I would, I would love that for us to live in a place where you don't have to actually sort of become woke, quote unquote. I know that word has been really like taken from us. Um, but what I mean is to say just that the normal sort of process of coming of age in this country teaches us about its history um, and about how all of us can be like throughout our lifetimes um, agents of repairing that history. And I think I really look to Germany as an example there. Um, Germany just has done a really phenomenal job of not just getting at the sort of economic pieces of reparation, but they have really embedded, used monuments and memorials and curriculum and cultural norms um, to create a country um, where folks like there's no that people don't learn about the Holocaust when they are you know in college like it is a it is a it is a um it's a rite of passage and it's in a, it's a thing that's very um like set as something that's important from from the jump so um I really see us um learning from that example and it's funny when I'm in Europe and I share what I do uh sometimes I I I wonder whether people will totally understand because concepts of race are different in Europe, but at the same, but people always get it immediately because there's such a mental model there of what it means kind of at the country level to actually repair. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for painting a vision that is also totally attainable. I mean, at least from sounding yeah. <laughs> from, yeah. from, from the way it sounds from coming from you, it's, it's very attainable and it feels uh, hopeful as well. Um, so I'm going to, uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat and then we're going to go over to, to very small breakout sessions. Um, but they're, they're similar enough that I'm going to tag them together. If that's all right. Um, um, so are there any articles or resources that might be helpful for discussing reparations? amongst the a small team or organization. Um, this person is thinking about how to share amongst DI committees in a corporate setting, for example. And tagging on to that question, is there any potential to collaborate with Inclusive to get reparations and some of this framework within, within their framework as a topic? Yes, absolutely. So I don't know about inclusive specifically, uh, happy to learn more, but what I would say is we published a report about the racial repair framework back in February. Um, that is, it really breaks down what each of the components mean in detail. And it goes into a lot of the evidence for why repair and each of those four components in particular are beneficial to us, both individually as well as collectively. And that's meant to be like a conversation starter. Um, and it's meant to really sort of help um, remove, help bring people out of the kind of current conceptions of what reparations means um, and create a more expansive frame for conversations to happen in particular in professional settings. Um, I will only just say that it is long. Um, we are working, it's like an 80 page report and I, I wrote it and I'm so sorry, um, but I am working on an executive summary version uh, and so if you join our mailing list, um, that will, we're like aiming for that to come out in the next few months, um, just because I know sometimes, especially when these kinds of things get added to like people's day jobs, it's just hard to read something that long. Um, so Aria, I will say though, it's 80 pages of gold. You don't tell <laughs> me that. It's so worth reading. So I would encourage I was gonna say, you. Are you, are you willing to share it? I'm kind of I'm yes. curious. I'm be open to 80 pages. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I will put it. <laughs> I will put it in the chat right now. Um, it is, it's on our website. You can, um, you can download it. Uh, let's see, let's put it in the chat. Aria, with your expansion and all your aspirations of everything that you're doing, is there a particular skill set that you, that would be helpful to add into your team or support that you're looking for um, in this space? Good question. Oh, I love that question. Um, I will answer that both for our team as well as for sort of like movement uh, overall. Yeah. Um, and we totally have dreams of like, like building the best, most awesome matching program for folks that want to like use their skills in a volunteer capacity with our movement partners. Um, yeah, but yeah. that is, uh, those not in, ex in existence yet. Um, 
We are, uh, LV is likely going to hire um, soon. We are just starting um, to think about the process. So we'll probably hire four-ish roles um, in the beginning of 2024, or sometime between like October and April. Um, looking for a um, senior person on the operations side, a senior person on the strategy and movement partners side, mm -hmm. and then a senior person um, uh, sort of on the kind of like donor organizing side, not traditional mm -hmm. development, but more so really thinking about how are we building communities and on ramps and learning platforms and basically getting more donors comfortable and um, investing more freely mm -hmm. in this work. Mm -hmm. um, so it won't be sort of the traditional, like just invest in liberation ventures. It'll be really thinking about um, a broader strategy that includes not only national level foundations, but also place-based. Mm -hmm. foundations mm -hmm. especially in places where task forces are being stood up mm -hmm. um so I would say all of that and then I'll say an analyst on our narrative team as well as, as mm -hmm. who we're looking to hire um then I will also say um the uh you know movement our movement partners um have like there are common challenges that they're facing um where they could definitely use capacity. Um, one is communications, mm. two, two is fundraising. And I would say three is um, some, uh, you know, like, I wouldn't say full strategic planning processes, but really kind of um, articulating their vision and strategy um, uh, in ways that can be um, supportive to both like the team being able to mm -hmm. problem solve and iterate on it, um, but then also communicating it to other audiences. Um, so I would say mm -hmm. all those things. Oh, and I love that someone just put the big payback in the chat um, that I'm very proud. We invested in the big payback, The both the producer, well, Robin, who's the protagonist in the big payback, is one of our movement partners, as I mentioned, but then also Color Farm Media produced it and we invested in Color Farm Media and they have been, they're just amazing partners um, and mm -hmm. are doing a lot of work with multiple movement partners. And so please, please do watch Big Payback. 